everyone. Today when I'm recording this is the 20th of May 2021. I'm Roy Potter. Welcome. And this is number one in the Eisenman series discussion. That's kind of how I'm going to call it. This is a very complicated, in-depth, exhaustive work that Eisenman has done. His research, uh, his bibliographies, his endnotes, the sources, uh, it gets redundant in a lot of ways, but he does that, as I've explained before, because it does go against what we've been told for 2,000 years about the history of the first century. While I say that I don't really want to take this from a faith-based perspective, of course, I want to take it from an historical perspective, at the same time I realize that this history impacts on the faith-based systems. And that's as it should be as far as our discussion here goes. So there are going to be some things in here that are very disturbing to you if you're a traditional Christian of any sort, Catholic or all the way through the Protestant religions or, or even with some of the others. Things that have come out of the historical events of the period that, that basically, in fact, were altered or changed to match uh, the new system that was coming into place. You could almost say that it was a great reset of sorts, kind of like what we're going through now with this whole system that's happening with the financial system and the shutdowns and all of that with this uh, situation that's going on, which I won't say here <laughs> uh, for obvious reasons. But I've asked you to get certain books uh, if you can. If you can't, don't worry. We're still going to cover some of the information here. I'm going to try to condense it to just the topics that you'll actually be interested in. And I may not be exactly right on that, but I've kind of watched how uh, the folks who watch my channel uh, kind of get concerned about certain topics, issues, subjects. And so I think I can take Eisenman's work and condense it down into the things that will be of most interest to you, that will help you to see why I, in particular, I have taken the stand I have, but also why the Dead Sea Scrolls were shut away from all of us for so long. And thanks to Professor Robert Eisenman, those Dead Sea Scrolls were finally uh, revealed to the public. But they were kept secret for a long time because they realized that they were, many of them, first century materials. And they're just now starting to admit that. It's taken this long since the 40s, uh, 47 to 50, 1947 to 1950, that period of time when they were discovered and some as late as 54. And they're still uncovering more uh, now and then. But uh, the, the scholars, and as I explained before, in the Ecole uh, Nationale, the Bibliothèque Nationale, the Israeli Antiquities Authority, etc., realized that the information, if, it, if they admitted that a lot of this was in the first century, that it would impact negatively many of the Christian institutions and the, the traditions uh, that have been passed down uh, in common taunt with those. So, All I can say is, is that if you're interested in finding out what happened in the historical events of the first century and even the second and third, then you might be interested in watching what I'm going to do here, what we're going to discuss. Uh, if those things, and I make this caveat all the time, if those things disturb you, then it's probably best you don't do this, okay? but. I'll leave that up to you, but I just want to make sure that you understand that I'm definitely not trying to force this down your throat. Only those who are interested, and that's why I'm doing it, because they've asked me to do it. In addition, uh, you might want to again consider reading the manuscript to my book. The book is out of print, The Crimson Thread, The Struggle to Become Jesus During the Revolt Against Rome. It's no longer available, used copies if you can find them, but they're usually really expensive. But you can get the manuscript to my book, not the book I guess they call it the proof text, uh, where the mistakes have been fixed and all that. This isn't the proof text, okay? For one thing, it's kind of it, it, it takes kind of a book form, but the way it's laid out, it's just difficult to read like that. So I've given you the manuscript that uh, the, the proof text was taken from, and then, of course, the final book print, 
and there was a second edition. But regardless, it's going to be in the description box below, the website that Roosevelt put together and included the manuscript so that you can read it there, okay? So I will put that link to the website in the description box, all right? And you can also get that, of course, on the uh, Crimson Thread reading uh, that I did, that, that uh, playlist there as well. By the way, this Eisenman discussion will be put on a playlist as well, um, number one through however many we do, okay? So this is going to be labor intensive, so I can't say that I'll do it on a regular basis, but I'll, I'll do it as, as often as I reasonably can. Okay, so what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, you've, you've heard about this before. We've talked about it. Uh, it's a very thick book. It's uh, 1,100 and, uh, well, yeah, 1,100 pages about. We also have its sequel, which uh, some of you have already gotten, the New Testament Code. Now, don't feel, if you've gotten this, don't feel like you've got to jump back and, and buy this other one, although I, I would certainly encourage you to have James, the brother of Jesus. But if you have this one, just go ahead and go through this. It'll give you a feel for what's going on. A lot of the material is redundant anyway. And again, the reason why Eisenman does that is because it is so intricate and so many things impact other things <laughs> that come up. So if you have this, great, that's good. Uh, but this, So we're going to be talking about those two books. And we're going to throw in information out of Josephus, as I've shown you before. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Josephus here as well, because uh, this really impacts a lot of our understandings, not just from the first century, but kind of understanding what happened subsequent to that because of problems with the storylines in traditional Christianity uh, as they developed. Okay, so uh, let's get to the whiteboard here and let me show you a couple of things. As I said, we're talking about Eisenman. This is the Eisenman discussion series. This is number one. I might as well put that up there so everybody knows. This is number one. <laughs> All right. And I don't know if you can see. I'm going to have to try to get a black pen, I suppose. So the things that are important uh, in this entire study, I can't possibly list all of the research material that Eisenman used. Let me back over on this side since the light's kind of bad there, my shadow throwing it. But I wanted to list some of them here. So under Eisenman's books, I've shown you, and he has many other books, as you well know, but we're kind of focusing on these at the moment. And they're, they're, they'll take up plenty of your time, trust me. I've shown you Josephus, and in Josephus, uh, you have uh, the life of Josephus. You have uh, the antiquities of the Jews. You have the wars of the Jews. You have against Appion, and then you have some dissertations. Uh, all of those play into this, but will primarily be uh, involved in antiquities, wars, and life. Now, the antiquity, let, let's start off with the wars. The, the Wars of the Jews was written um, starting at the time that uh, Josephus was captured by the Romans. He was, a, a, as I've explained, a Jewish general, um, claimed to be of a Maccabean priestly line. And uh, after he was uh, defeated in battle and then captured, uh, in order to save his life, he, he told Vespasian that he is basically fulfilling the star prophecy that a, a world leader, the Messianic leader, the Messiah, would come out of, out of uh, that area, and that it was Vespasian. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to show you that and also some other things. But the wars basically talks about the different Jewish wars that are going on, particularly the one that we're going to focus on is the one uh, that started in about 66 AD and, and went on through to about, to about uh, 74 uh, we're not going to get so much into the Bar Kokhba re rebellion uh, later because Josephus doesn't cover that because it's after his time. But he does cover some of the other things earlier uh, that, that were going on in the late 1st century BC, including the Maccabeans, uh, even back to the 2nd century BC and a little bit further. Um, and then, of course, uh, the situation starting in, in 1 AD all the way forward to uh, uh, about 90 AD total. When, when you look at the whole thing. Now, uh, in the wars, though, it just takes it up through uh, uh, the Masada period, basically. So he wrote that, basically, in 70 AD. It's in the 70s. So he, he was writing the wars in the 70s AD. Okay, that's when he put that together, all right? 
uh, antiquities, he didn't finish that until, uh, it maybe not even started, he didn't finish it though until the 90s AD, early 90s. So in other words, what came first was, was the wars, and then he wrote antiquities later, and that becomes important, especially when we look at the, at the uh, prophecy of, of, of Vespasian being the Messiah, as opposed to what we call the testimonium Flavianum, which I'm going to get to uh, during the course of this discussion. And then in Life of uh, Josephus, he talks about being uh, schooled by an individual who was in a scene by the name of Banus. Banus just is talking about bathers, okay? It even sounds like bathing, but that's what it was. And that's what the Qumran community was all about, the Essenes. The ritual daily baths, which are called mikvahs. Uh, where the idea of baptism came from in the Christian traditions. And in there, uh, he, he talks about being schooled by this Spanish guy who, who Eisenman uh, identifies as James. Okay, so James apparently and Josephus uh, knew each other uh, at some point in time early on, probably in the... Jo Josephus was born in about 37 A.D., uh, so probably starting in about, oh, probably around 48 or something like that, uh, he would have been introduced to different schools, especially being a priest, a Maccabean priest. Uh, and, and James, who was the opposition high priest against the Herodian high priest establishment, uh, apparently had something to do with uh, Josephus' training. And his ability to do the history that he did is, is very evident that that was the case, especially in his understanding of, of the different groups and things involved. So we're going to show you that in life. Now there's some other historians and church fathers that did history and things like that that we're going to not be able to cover except just tangentially as we go through the work. And this again is not a complete list, but it'll give you an idea of, of what we're going to look at here. Uh, Hegesippus, who is kind of like a Josephus number two, kind of like 2.0. And a lot of the later church fathers and historians refer to Hegesippus because he covers things in a little more detail that, that Josephus didn't for various reasons. Eusebius, Irenaeus, Epiphanius, Origen, Augustine, Philo, Pliny, Jerome, Justin, that's Justin Martyr. <laughs> and of course the Nag Hammadi Gnostic codices, uh, which were uh, found in uh, the 40s as well. So I wanted to, uh, the 1940s. So I wanted to just bring those up so you kind of know the, the information where it's coming from. And like I said, we could add to this list here, but if I need to do that, we'll bring it up during the discussions. Uh, by the way, you can't get this stuff. <laughs> I, I had to use books. Uh, I think some of it's online, um, but, but not all of it. Uh, but the books are, are very hard to get, and if you can get them, I'm sure you're going to pay a lot of money for it. So I would stick primarily with Josephus, and then uh, get your other stuff offline. That's how I or online off the uh, off the internet. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, Eisenman is concerned basically with the events of the first century uh, around the lives of uh, the person we know, the man we know as Jesus. Uh, his brother James and his other brothers, by the way, as, as I've talked about in many of my presentations, uh, wh uh, whether they were full-blooded, full uh, full brothers, or whether they were half-brothers or cousins or whatever, Eisenman covers all that and shows that, you know, what I've been talking about that's also in my book, The Crimson Thread. Um, we're going to talk in depth about James because the, and, and, and Paul, Paul the Apostle, because a lot of what transpires in the New Testament and in church uh, tradition, legend, uh, doctrine, dogma, etc., really revolves around these two, even almost more than Jesus. But, but we'll get into that as well so that you can kind of understand the issues. So these are kind of the central people that we're going to talk about that influenced um, the scholarship and the, the difficulties that we encounter when we use the Dead Sea Scrolls and our and the known history, like from Josephus, and and match that up to the New Testament uh, in total. Okay, all right. Well, let's talk about a couple of important things. Let's bring up the Dead Sea Scrolls first, which I didn't list up here, but you know that that's always an issue uh, that I bring up. Uh, 
you can get some of these online, uh, but some you'll have to buy a book, and I don't have uh, them handy right now. Eisenman has one, I think it's called the De Dead Sea Scrolls in Early Christianity, which has these particular documents that I'm going to talk about, but I just want to tell you about them, and I have before. There's uh, these are the Qumranian Dead Sea Scroll documents, and there are many of them. There are, there are a hundred, hundreds of them, actually. But uh, we're going to talk about these, these five. The Damascus document, MMT, which is basically the letters on righteousness, which are attributed to James and, and go along with what he says uh, in Acts, what James says in Acts and in um, uh, the, the epistle of James. And there are even some things in Corinthians. The community rule, which is also the manual of discipline. The war scroll, okay, and the Habakkuk Pesher. All important, okay, all of those are important. Okay, I've got a few notes here. Uh, let's go ahead and, and discuss uh, some of these issues here. Uh, I've got a little uh, diagram here of what Eisenman says is the line of succession, uh, and I, I thought I'd show you that. Uh, it goes from Jesus to James, not Peter, and he, Eisenman explains why, and we'll get into some of that. Then it goes to the community council, which is very, there were 12, 12 members of the community council. This is where the idea of the 12 apostles came from, not just the 12 tribes of Israel, but this community council that was in uh, the Qumran community, and they were the governing council that had authority just right under James, okay? And then under them were the rest of the people, called the poor, the meek, the many, and those are just different divisions of people that have diff certain access based upon how far they've gone in the laws of, of purity. Um, and, and I'll get into some of that as we go. Uh, they weren't so much initiation rites like you'd think of in secret societies. They were their willingness to live at certain levels of piety, of, of holiness, so to speak. Uh, and as I said before, in, in my opinion, some of those went too far, and I think even Jesus would have felt that way. But Eisenman won't look at it like that, as you'll find out, because I'll be presenting his viewpoints more than mine. Okay? All right, well, let's talk about a couple of other things that I have up here. As I mentioned, the Jewish War was written for the 70s, the Antiquities in the 90s. Uh, there's no mention of James at all in the wars. And there's a question as to why that is when he played such a significant part, especially since Christianity has said that uh, the reason why Jerusalem was destroyed was because they, they, uh, the, the, uh, the Jews crucified Jesus. But, in fact, the historians of the period and the events that occurred, even in Josephus, uh, show that that's not really the case, but Josephus doesn't cover James in the wars. He covers it in the antiquities. And there's a reason for that, as I said. The reason is because uh, in the wars he had just been captured. Uh, he, he did this thing called the, the Star Prophecy, applying it to Vespasian about the, mess, the Messiah coming, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And he had to watch his P's and Q's when he was writing the wars. He couldn't really uh, advertise the fact, even though it was known, uh, he tried to downplay his his role in fighting the Romans, okay? So he kind of downplayed that and some of the things that brought about uh, his, his attitudes and, and what he did, particularly when he wrote The Life and he admits to being schooled by this Banus individual who uh, we're pretty sure was actually James himself. Uh, and considering that James and his his concepts, his... His, his teachings uh, were, were what was steering the Messianic revolt against Rome. Uh, Josephus probably wanted to pull back on that a little bit, okay, and not get too far in it. So James is not mentioned in the wars. He is men mentioned in the antiquities, however, uh, along with all the other characters of the New Testament that you might know. Not all the characters, but a lot of them. John the Baptist, Simon Magus, um, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, the Judas, for instance, uh, individual, and some of those things. Okay, uh, again, a lot of that in, in Josephus is is expanded upon by Hegesippus, 
who can look at things from a little further down the line and can tie some other things together. For instance, uh, Judas, the brother of James and Jesus, uh, and of Peter, that you would know Peter or Cephas, how he was beheaded by the Romans for his uh, conduct in trying to get people uh, to escape uh, the Romans. Uh, so anyway, um, this is where you're going to find a lot of that information. Uh, let's talk about something that I think you'd like to, to, to hear about here. And we're not going to necessarily get into Eisenman's stuff directly today because I want to do that in a, in a very uh, sequential manner if I possibly can. I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that impacted Eisenman's study, not just the Dead Sea Scrolls, but some other things. And one of those is the Testimonium Flavianum. It's in Antiquities, and I'm going to read this to you. Okay, it's okay. It's in uh, Book 18, Chapter 3, uh, Number 3. And you'll, you'll get used to this if you get your Josephus uh, materials. You'll see how that works. So this is Book 18, Chapter 3, uh, Section 3. Let's put it that way. Let me read this to you. But after I read this to you, I'm going to show you where this was inserted and why I consider it to be fraudulent, that it wasn't written by Josephus that it was inserted later by somebody who realized that he hadn't talked that much about a Jesus. There was one or two other places, and I'm going to mention those in a minute. But those are not quite as strong as this is. So let's read this uh, particular section three. Let me, let me show you what this says. This is called the Testimonium Flavianum, and this is what all the Christians go to to show, oh, Josephus talked about Jesus. Okay, so let's read this. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. Okay, he's writing this in the Antiquities, supposedly, in the 90s, 90 AD. I want you to remember that he's just said that he was the Christ. Okay, keep that in mind. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, meaning the Jews, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct at this day. Again, this is in the 90s AD. Now, there are some things in that that Josephus would not have written. Okay, uh, First of all, calling him the Christ after what he had said to, to Vespasian earlier, uh, Vespa, uh, the emperor at this time uh, would have executed him, okay, uh, and for, for violating Vespasian's declaration, the declaration of Vespasian being uh, the actual Christ or Messiah, uh, which I'll read here in just a minute. But there are some other things here, too, that are important. He, he talks about that he drew over both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. Historically, now that's very questionable, okay, that that was the case. Uh, and uh, also, of course, that where it says here that he was the Christ, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, the Jews, had condemned him to the cross. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that that probably didn't happen, that that was something that was put in by, as far as the idea of the Jews actually calling for his crucifixion, that probably never really happened. He was actually crucified, as I've said many, many times. You don't get crucified under Roman law for, for blasphemy uh, or, or any of those things. You, not even the tax, necessarily. It depends, uh, the Roman tax, but certainly for insurrection. And uh, that's what happened. So uh, there's some indications here historically that this is, a, is an insertion later. But the most telling part to, to be able to understand that this is 
an insertion by someone later, or that, that Josephus did it as a tongue-in-cheek thing because he didn't really believe this. He just threw it in there, uh, kind of like uh, making fun of it. Let me read to you what this is about. It's, it's, it's one paragraph. Let me show you. It's one paragraph, if you can see it outlined there, one paragraph in this entire period about this guy who apparently raised from the dead and all this, and he's going to devote one paragraph to him right there. And a sandwich between this information here, which I'm going to not read the whole thing, but a little bit of it, and then this crazy situation that happens right here. And when you hear this second one, you're going to say, why would he put the thing about Jesus there? Okay, let's read this. So this is uh, before he gets to this testimony in Flavianum. Uh, it's talking about a rebellion of the Jews against Pontius Pilate. And Pilate basically slaughters a bunch of them. I'm just going to start. I'm going to start back, maybe just a few lines back here. This way. Here's the here's the uh, paragraph. I'm going to start a little up here, just so you can kind of get the feel for where this thing comes in. Some of them also use reproaches and abuse the man, as crowds of such people usually do. So this is talking about Pilate. So he outfitted a great number of his soldiers in the clothing of the crowd. This is in my book, by the way. This is, a, this is a, a, an actual slaughter that I, I record in my book in the story. So he outfitted a great number of his soldiers in the clothing of the crowd who carried daggers under their garments and sent them to a place where they might surround them. So he directed the Jews himself to go away. But when they boldly cast reproaches upon him, he gave the soldiers that signal which had been beforehand agreed upon who laid upon them much greater blows than Pilate had commanded them, and equally punished those that were disorderly and those that were not. Nor did they spare them in the least, and since the people were unarmed and were caught by men prepared for what they were about, there were a great number of them killed by this means, and others of them ran away wounded, and thus an end was put to this rebellion. Now he goes to the testimony in Flavianum, which I just wrote. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, etc., etc. I just read that too. Now after the testimony of Flavianum, listen to what comes next. About the same time also, another sad calamity put the Jews into disorder, and certain shameful practices happened about the temple of Isis that was at Rome. I will now first take notice of the wicked attempt about the temple of Isis, and will then give an account of the Jewish affairs. There was, at Rome, a woman whose name was Paulina, one who, on account of the dignity of her ancestors and by the regular conduct of a virtuous life, had a great reputation. She was also very rich. And although she was a beautiful countenance, and in that flower of her age wherein women are the most gay, wouldn't use that word today, but yet did she lead a life of great modesty. She was married to Saturnius, one that was very way answerable, in every way answerable to her in an excellent character. Decus Mundus fell in love with this woman. He was a man very high in the equestrian order, and as she was of too great dignity to be caught by presence and had already rejected them, Though they had been sent in great abundance, he was still more inflamed with love to her, insomuch that he promised to give her 200,000 attic drachmas for one night's sexual encounter. There's another word there, but... <laughs> and when this would not prevail upon her, and he was not able to bear this misfortune in his amours, he thought it the best way to famish himself to death for want of food on account of Paulina's sad refusal, and he determined within himself to die after such a manner, and he went on with his purpose accordingly. Now Mundus had a freedwoman, who had been made free by his father, whose name was Eid, one skillful in all sorts of mischief. This woman was very much grieved at the young man's resolution to kill himself, for he did not conceal his intentions to destroy himself from others and came to him and encouraged him by her discourse and made him to hope by some promises she gave him that he might obtain a night's sexual encounter with Paulina. And when he joyfully hearkened to her entreaty, she said she wanted no more than 50,000 drachmas for entrapping the woman. So when he when she had encouraged the young man and gotten as much money as she required, she did not take the same methods as had 
been taken before because she perceived that the woman was by no means to be tempted by money. But as she knew that she was very much given to the worship of the goddess Isis, she devised the following stratagem. She went to some of Isis's priests, and upon the strongest assurances of concealment, she persuaded them by words, but chiefly by the offers of money of 25,000 drachmas in hand, and as much more when the thing had taken effect, and told them the passion of the young man, and persuaded them to use all means possible to beguile the woman. <laughs> So they were drawn in to promise so to, so they were drawn in to promise so to do by that large sum of gold they were to have. Accordingly, the oldest of them went immediately to Paulina, and upon his admittance, he desired to speak with her by herself. When that was granted him, he told her that he was sent by the god Anubis, who was fallen, who has fallen in love with her and directed her to come to him. Upon this, she took the message very kindly and valued herself greatly upon this condescension of Anubis and told her husband that she had a message sent her and was to dine and lie with Anubis. So he agreed to her acceptance of the offer as fully satisfied with the chastity of his wife. Accordingly, she went to the temple, and after she had dined there, and it was the hour to go to sleep, the priest shut the doors of the temple when, in the holy part of it, the lights were also put out. Then did Mundus leap out, for he was hidden therein, and did not fail to enjoy her, who was at his service all the night long, as supposing he was the god. And when he was gone away, which was before those priests, who knew nothing of the stratagem were stirring, Paulina came early to her husband and told him how the god Anubis had appeared to her. Among her friends also she declared how great a value she put upon this favor, who partly disbelieved the thing when they reflected on its nature, and partly were amazed at it as having no pretense for not believing it, when they considered the modesty and dignity of the person. Do you see what this story is? It's about a God, right? It's about a man who has a lust for this married woman. And the stratagem is that an intercessor, someone who helps him, another woman, goes to the priests in the temple of Isis and tells them to, that, to bring this woman there. And then she's arranged this woman that's been paid has arranged to have Mundus in there to pretend to be the god Anubis, who then has a sexual encounter with Paulina. This is right after. I hope you're reading between the lines here, okay? This was probably a real event. But what's happened here is why would you put an information about Jesus being the Messiah and resurrected and all that between these two stories, one of Pilate killing the Jews and the other of this, of this sexual encounter like that. Well, it was probably either a convenient place for someone to place it in there for and in behalf of Josephus or Josephus did it as a tongue-in-cheek thing, partly playing on the Talmudic story later that Mary, the mother of Jesus, had actually been raped by a Roman soldier by the name of Pantera. Whatever, it's out of place. We don't have any of the original Josephus uh, manuscripts, so there's no way to tell if that was originally in there. But considering its placement, what he says about this Jesus in one paragraph, which you'd think he would have taken up a lot more time. I mean, he, told, he took up more space talking about Paulina and Mundus than he did about Jesus. <laughs> okay? So something's wrong with the testimonium Flavianum. It's either tongue-in-cheek on Josephus' part, or somebody inserted it there later. Okay, let's talk about Vespasian because I just read where in Antiquities, which is now in the 90s, Josephus has already pronounced Vespasian as the Messiah, as the person coming out of Palestine who would rule the world, which is the star prophecy. And I'm going to read that to you right now. Okay, that's page 8. 
99. In the 70s, in the Jewish War, this is Book 6, Chapter 5, Section 4. Let me read that again. In the Jewish War, Book 6, Chapter 5, Section 4, starting at 312. You'll see what I'm talking about with these numbers when you get to Josephus. And let me read this to you. So, well, I'll just read it. But now, what did the most elevate them in undertaking this war was an ambiguous oracle that was also found in their sacred writings how, about that time, one from their country should become governor of the habitable earth. Talking about the Messiah. The Jews took this prediction to belong to themselves in particular, and many of the wise men were thereby deceived in their determination. Now this oracle certainly denoted the government of Vespasian, who was appointed emperor in Judea. That's in the wars. He writes that in 70 AD. So if he called Vespasian this Messiah in 70 AD, would he really, <laughs> in 90 AD, write the Testimonium Flavianum and risk being executed by Rome. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Let me look at one other thing here. The story about when he is captured and what happens there when he also says it personally to Vespasian. So this is in Book 3 of the Jewish War, Chapter 9, Section 9, and I'm going to start at 401. Again, you'll see what this is when you get it. So the Jewish War, Book 3, Chapter 9, Section 9, starting at 401. And this is Josephus talking to Vespasian. Do you, this is right after he's captured. <laughs> Do you send me to Nero? For why? Are Nero's successors, until they come to you, still alive? You, O oh Vespasian, are Caesar. No, Nero was Caesar at this time, not Vespasian. So he's making a prophecy that Vespasian is going to be the emperor. And of course he becomes one, so that gives Vespasian more trust in this, this Jewish general, priestly, Maccabean priest, right? So let me start over again. Do you send me to Nero for why? Are Nero's successors until they come to you still alive? You, O Vespasian, are Caesar and emperor. You and this your son, Titus, is who he's talking about, who, who actually uh, destroyed Jerusalem. Bind me now still faster and keep me for yourself. For you, O Caesar, are not only Lord over me, but over the land and the sea and all mankind. Again, this is the star prophecy. And certainly I deserve to be kept in closer custody than I now am in order to be punished. If I rashly affirm anything of God. When he said this, Vespasian at present did not believe him, but supposed that Josephus said this as a cunning trick in order to uh, ensure his own preservation. But in a little time he was convinced and believed what he said to be true, God himself erecting his expectations so as to think of obtaining the empire and by other signs foreshadowing his advancement. I don't think after doing that that, he, that Josephus would turn around and call Jesus the Christ. I don't think he'd do that. Okay. Let's look at uh, one last thing, and uh, then I'll let you go because it's already been uh, almost a half an hour. And like I said, this is kind of a, this is somewhat impromptu. I, I don't really have a whole lot of notes. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to get the introduction started so that uh, we, we would know that we're actually going to do this. And I'm trying still to, to come up with a, an outline that will be efficacious to you. So what I want to do is now go to James. We're not going to talk about Paul today, okay? Uh, I just want you to know that this whole thing with Paul is obviously going to impact on, on how we view the current situation uh, with the New Testament. 
But let's, let's go to James, and I told you about the fact that Josephus mentions James a couple of times. Um, so let's do this first. Uh, in Antiquities, he does it in the life, too, where, where, he, where Banus or, or James, it's probably James. As a matter of fact, it almost has to be, because he's called that in some other writings. But let's read this on page uh, 656 uh, of James. So I'm going to read this. It's in chapter 9. This is book 20, chapter 9, section 1. And it's going to start at about uh, the 199 point. And again, you'll see when you get one of these what I'm talking about. But this younger Ananus, who, as we have told you already, took the high priesthood, was a bold man in his temper and very insolent. He was also of the sect of the Sadducees, who are very rigid in judging offenders. Above all the rest of the Jews, as we have already observed, when therefore Ananus was of this disposition, he thought he had now a proper opportunity to exercise his authority. Festus was now dead, and Albinus was but upon the road, so he assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others for some of his companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. But as for those who seemed the most equitable of the citizens, and as such were the most uneasy at the breach of the laws, they disliked what was done. They also sent to the king Agrippa, desiring him to send Ananus, that he should act so no more. So there's, there's the story of James, the brother of Jesus, being stoned in, in Josephus. Notice he calls him the Christ there again. Uh, I think that was probably added in later. Uh, it may have said something like in the original, and I'm just guessing here, um, Jesus uh, the, the Sicari, or Jesus the Messianic leader, or, or, or something similar to that was probably how it was in there before. Probably Messianic leader. And then they just changed it to Christ, okay? Because that's a Pauline insistence. <laughs> and I know that's going to disturb a lot of people, but that's... That's how this is all going to work out as we go through Eisenman's works and the Dead Sea Scrolls and these other historians. So that'll end this uh, number one of Eisenman's discussion series. And uh, I'm not sure where we're, we're going to go next. Uh, I think I'll probably do a workup on the association of these three characters in particular and it's kind of like what I've done in the past, but use Eisenman work, Eisenman's works uh, to kind of get us going. And uh, I will probably start off in this book, and we will start off with me explaining some things in the introduction. Unlike when I did the reading of my book, I don't think I can legally, <laughs> even though he'd probably tell me it's fine, um, to read... Uh, his book verbatim, plus you don't want to sit through all of this. So what I'll do is, is I've outlined certain things that I think are important in our discussions, and I'll just take a page-by-page page, uh, uh, explanation uh, of the things that I have outlined that you might consider of importance, okay? That'll kind of give you a feel for what this is all about. All right. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. I, I hope that wasn't uh, too painful to go through, and uh, we'll see you next time out here for now.